Greetings, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the Wilson Center. Those of you joining me here in the auditorium and our large audience online, welcome. Thank you so much for your interest in this activity. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I direct our Latin America program here at the Wilson Center. I am delighted to welcome Monica Medina, the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, back to the Wilson Center. Monica, as you know, has served in this role since September of 2021, focusing on a dizzying and rather intimidating set of threats to this planet, from climate change and biodiversity loss to water insecurity, pollution, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. In this role, she helped launch global negotiations to address plastic pollution, and she fought for the historic High Seas Treaty announced just last month at the United Nations after more than a decade of negotiations. In September of 2022, just about a year ago, Secretary Blinken gave Monica additional responsibilities, naming her as Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources. Those, again, on top of her considerable tasks as the Assistant Secretary of the OES Bureau at the State Department. For the Wilson Center, Monica has been a terrific ally and friend, both to our Environmental Change and Security Program and to our Latin America Program and other colleagues here at the Center, specifically for our efforts to protect marine biodiversity in the eastern tropical Pacific. Last October, here in this building, Monica joined us in announcing an exciting new partnership between the Wilson Center and the State Department to support Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Panama in their ambitious attempts to safeguard their tropical waters from unsustainable fishing practices, including by China's industrial deepwater fishing fleet and international criminal networks. This is a historic, unique, transnational marine protected corridor and one that has received a great deal of support from the United States government and resources and political attention, in large part because of Monica's commitment to this issue and her relationships throughout the Western Hemisphere. We again worked with Monica's terrific team just last month in Panama, where we hosted the Secretary of the U.S. Navy and other senior U.S. officials and the head of the Colombian Navy on the margins of the Our Ocean Conference, where we discussed ways the United States and its partners could help the region address the obstacles to achieving their newly ambitious marine protection goals. Our support for conservation in the Amazon, including in Brazil, also complements the terrific work Monica and her colleagues have done in re-engaging with Brazil on these critical issues since the change in government in the last few months. Perhaps most importantly, as the White House has increased its focus on climate and conservation issues, Monica has showcased consistently how foreign policy and environmental protection are intricately linked these days, and how environmental diplomacy strengthens U.S. global leadership and U.S. international relationships, while also promoting ambitious policies to protect our planet. We were thrilled to hear of Monica's recent appointment as the next president of the Wildlife Conservation Society, where she'll be a terrific leader of an absolutely essential global organization. But I can't say we're happy she's leaving the State Department, and worse, that she's actually moving to New York. Friday will be her last day in this role, and so we, must, uh, we insisted that she join us at least one more time here at the center for a conversation with my colleague, Lauren Risi, Director of Environmental Change and Security Program, to discuss the lessons learned during her time as Assistant Secretary and Special Envoy, and the importance of prioritizing large-scale biodiversity conservation on land and at sea, addressing water scarcity, and raising the profile of these and other environmental challenges in U.S. diplomacy and in working these issues in concert with a variety of other priorities being pursued by the State Department and the national security world. This will be Monica's last public event in this role, so we're glad that you're here to be part of the conversation. And after a fireside-style chat with Lauren and Monica, we will be turning to you in this room um, to talk about the interests that you have in marine and, and land conservation and U.S. environmental policy. So you'll be very much part of this conversation. Let me end by wishing everyone a belated happy Earth Day. I'll now turn to Monica for brief introductory remarks before Lauren takes over here up on the podium. Again, thank you so much for being here, Monica. Congratulations on all your work. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Benjamin, for that very lovely welcome. I. Um, I'm so lucky to have had a chance to do this job, and it's such an honor 
to get to be here for my last real public event um, and my last chance to serve publicly as America's senior diplomat for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs. What an amazing thing, um, a privilege it's been to serve in this role. Um, it's been the opportunity of a lifetime and I've loved this job with all of my heart and soul. Um, I have had a wonderful team uh, supporting me at the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and International Scientific Affairs, OES, and we've really um, made environmental diplomacy a priority, both in our national government um, and for our foreign policy. And I don't think that's going to change no matter uh, what happens, no matter who sits in this chair from here on forward. I think the Biden administration has really um, reset the way we think about uh, environment globally. We restored our leadership in addressing things like climate change. We rejoined Paris. The um, ocean and biodiversity issues, plastic pollution, nature crimes, they've all been front and center as part of what the work I've been doing, but also that the secretary um, and the other secretary, Secretary Kerry, have worked very hard on. And we've reinvigorated space and science diplomacy at the same time, which is another part of this incredible bureau with amazing reach. I um, remember when I was preparing for my confirmation hearings, you know, we tried to put it into words. How big is this bureau? It really literally goes from the farthest reaches of outer space to the depths of the ocean floor at its deepest and below that. So it couldn't be a bigger um, set of responsibilities, as Benjamin said, but it couldn't be more exciting time to be doing this work. And to have had the chance to really think about how do we bring indigenous leaders and frontline communities and young people and women into this conversation. We've tried very hard to do that as well. You know, when I started, I felt like we really were at this pivotal moment at a crossroads for uh, conservation work globally. Um, we could, you know, keep going in this sort of business as usual path, or we could change our ways. We could continue to neglect nature, not just think about climate, but nature, or we could choose a different way of proceeding into the future. And I honestly spend all my time as I think about how to tackle all the challenges ahead of us, what would we want for our children and our grandchildren? I think about that every time I talk about it in almost every event, every public, um, public speech I make. Uh, and, and so, I couldn't be more optimistic um, because I think we now have come to the recognition that we have to solve these challenges together, that multilateralism and diplomacy are absolutely essential to getting them right. Um, it requires international cooperation and leadership, and people now really understand that. This past Earth Day, President Biden and Vice President Harris reaffirmed that every person has a right to breathe clean air, drink clean water, and live in a healthy community now and in the future. And if we are to pass on that kind of a world to future generations, one with thriving oceans, forests, rivers, and with biodiversity, with clean water, we have to work together and with other partners around the world. And that is sort of now our, I think, fundamental philosophy at the State Department beyond my bureau, but especially within our bureau. As America's diplomats, we offer the best that is American to address these issues. We have to lead with our values, our experience, our environmental action, um, our science, our research, our strong clean air and clean water laws, and our ability to innovate and to solve problems. Our values help to build trust, as, we, as, do, as does our history of environmental action. Um, you can think of our long history in conservation and our early anti-pollution laws that were some of the very first in the world. Americans are innovators and problem solvers, and this is due in no small part to a vibrant private sector. So today, the United States um, and the world kind of need this sort of collaboration with the private sector and innovation and their ability to invest in nature to help solve our biggest environmental challenges. In my work over the past two years, I've often called for cooperation to solve the many crises that we're facing, the climate crisis, the water crisis, the ocean crisis, the plastic pollution crisis, the biodiversity crisis, all of which 
if we don't deal with them right now, will have catastrophic consequences for the earth and everyone who lives on it. So recognizing that challenge can feel overwhelming. But I argue all the time that we have to be hopeful. We have to solve these problems with the optimism and that sense of ingenuity and that can-do spirit that is so uniquely American. And I do believe we're making progress and that our efforts are making a difference. So we need to be realistic. We need to understand that these are huge challenges. But I am more optimistic than ever before that we are going to be able to get to the solutions that we need. Let me give a few examples. Um, Let's start at the top with President Biden. He declared these issues a national priority from day one. This alone is a great achievement, and it gives us lots of room then to do work underneath that. Because when your leader says this is important, everybody gets it. Every, then other countries started to look to us, too, again as a leader. And that was a really reassuring and wonderful thing about this job. When I stepped into this role, it was about six months into the administration, but there is a cadre of environment ministers around the world who welcomed me into their ranks and who looked to me to be part of um, their very strong alliance, if you will, informal as it was, but we worked together to, to solve some of the bigger problems, to get the global agreement on plastic pollution launch, to work on, to, to get to a BB&J or a CBD 30 by 30 pledge. All of those things happened because we were working together and I was welcomed into this group of very active, engaged environment ministers around the world. And it was such a privilege to be part of that. Um, so let's talk about what we've accomplished. Um, uh, first of all, 30 by 30. At the end of last year, the parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity reached agreement on a new global biodiversity framework with the goal of conserving and, or protecting at least 30% of the world's lands, waters, oceans by 2030. We call it 30 by 30. But we really were specific in the agreement that it couldn't be just one part of the world or another. It had to be everywhere. It had to include indigenous peoples. It had to include fresh water. It had to include um, land in every part of the, of the, of the planet. Um, and so, you know, it's been an amazing thing to think about. How are we going to get there? How are we going to do that? That's an enormous challenge. But the U.S. is already... Um, doing its part. President Biden has designated over a half million acres in Nevada and Texas as national monuments and directed the Commerce Department to create what, we, what will be the largest fully protected new marine sanctuary off Hawaii, and that will protect 770,000 square miles of water, which, um, and that will get us to our 30 percent goal in the ocean as the U.S. And through our Ocean Conservation Pledge, that we in the U.S. have uh, spearheaded, we have invited other countries to pledge to protect at least 30 percent of their ocean. And some countries, frankly, are already there, which is wonderful, but there are a whole lot more that could make that pledge. Um, and we've also supported that through capacity building in, in efforts like the CIMAR project that um, Benjamin referred to, where we're helping these four countries put together the first of its kind four-country collective marine protected area. And we hope other countries will do the same thing so that we can create an even bigger uh, protection in the ocean through cooperation and collaboration. Second, on plastic pollution. The world is drowning in plastic, and we have to act now. We've launched a negotiation under the UN auspices to reach a global agreement on plastic pollution. And our goal, and it's a very ambitious one, is to try to end plastic pollution in the environment by 2040. End pollution, plastic pollution in the environment by 2040. That's a hugely ambitious goal. Um, and we hope that the U.S. Um, will spearhead this negotiation. We're part of the Bureau. Our, our lead negotiator will be one of the few negotiators who's actually writing and structuring the agreement on behalf of all the countries in the world. Um, and we believe that if we work hard to bring in the private sector, in indigenous communities, people who are impacted by plastic pollution in their communities, countries that are struggling to deal with this now, from small islands to developing countries all around the world, we will come up with a much better agreement, one that is ambitious 
innovative, and yet can be tailored to countries' own specific needs, not unlike the Paris Agreement, where countries have national plans that they have to live up to in a very publicly accountable way. Um, and we will need everyone involved in this effort, from NGOs, governments, state and local governments, and indigenous communities. And I'm, I'm pleased to say one of the things that's happening this week, I won't be there myself because it is my last week, but there is a huge effort um, to follow up on the Summit of the Americas last year with a cities summit of the Americas. It's happening this week in Denver. And one of the big topics of conversation will be plastic pollution and how cities throughout the Americas are trying to grapple with this tremendous problem. So we are using every lever we can at the State Department, even reaching down to state and local partners to try and solve these environmental problems. And we also hope to create a public-private partnership around plastic pollution, one that gives a platform for everyone to come together and talk about the ideas that they have about solving the problem, look for solutions that can be scaled, look for things that have worked in other countries and uh, try and figure out how to scale those um, government efforts at, at change. So with we think with a very robust private um, or non-governmental organization that brings people together in concert with the negotiations themselves, we'll be able to bring a whole lot more voices into the conversation about how to solve the plastic pollution problem. Third, protecting the high seas. We talked about this, ben, Benjamin talked about this a few minutes ago, that last month at the UN, the US and other nations reached a historic agreement um, on draft text. So the text has not been adopted yet, but but we have agreed the text, so we know more changes to it. And the, the adoption is sort of a formality after all of the translations are done. And this agreement covers the high seas, the areas beyond national jurisdiction, and it's unprecedented. Um, with this framework in place, we'll have a way to extend protection to, sh to shield, to protect large swaths of the high seas which is necessary, it's essential if we're gonna reach that 30 by 30 goal and conserve biodiversity in the oceans and protect all that the ocean provides us to sustain life on this planet. Uh, it's, it's in addition to these headline uh, achievements that we're also playing the long game, building relationships and capacity to advance environmental awareness and cooperation. We're doing this in the US in our embassies and consulates throughout the world, our environment, Science, Health, and Technology, or ESTH officers, they sit all over the world in embassies, and they play a critical role every day in our fight um, to conserve biodiversity, to build bridges across government, civil society, and the private sector, and to help decision makers make more environmentally sound, sustainable policies everywhere we, we are working around the world. And we've done another thing that was really exciting to me. We've revised our Science Envoys program. Envoys are an important um, part of how we, the U.S., reach out to other scientists from around the world. We've lured in um, experts who will, uh, in addition to their day jobs, travel around the world working with scientists, researchers, and interested public, uh, public uh, um, organizations to advance the role of science and technology. And this is the first cohort um, in many, many years and includes the first uh, science envoy at the nexus of environmental science and indigenous knowledge. So we specifically sought out someone with indigenous knowledge as their area of expertise, and that way we can share not only that, but learn from other indigenous communities all over the world on how to solve environmental challenges. I could go on and on. The Kigali Amendment or UN Water Week and the role we played there in our own uh, new global water action plan. Uh, we could talk about so many other things, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to do that in a minute, but it's really been an honor to be a part of this amazing team at OES and at the State Department to bring all of these things to light. I couldn't do this myself. It, no way could I have um, made all of this happen without the active engagement of think tanks, um, professionals from all over the government, uh, many sister agencies, people who've worked for decades in NGOs to see this kind of progress happen. If we weren't all working together, n none of this would happen. So I, I am just thrilled to have been able to be a part of it. I'm so proud 
of the work that we are doing together and that we will continue to do together because I know that we have a bright future ahead of us as long as we remember that the environment is not something we can take for granted. It's not a given. We have to work for it all the time from, from uh, today and into the future. And if we do that, then our children and our grandchildren and our children's children's children will benefit from a planet that can sustain them um, and generations to come. So uh, I hope everyone, I intend to keep at this. I'm not going very far. I'm actually going to continue the very work that I've been doing for the last few years now in a private sector role, and I'm excited about that. But I'm also excited about what will continue to happen here at the State Department with partners like you all and um, around the globe. So thank you all very much, and I'm excited to have a discussion now. There's a, a message here that says, don't adjust mics, and it throws me off every time because the first thing I want to do is it's adjust the mic. Yeah, I just did it. Um, thank you so much, Assistant Secretary. It's just such a privilege to have you here on, in the midst of what I'm sure is a very, very full week um, and, and to have an opportunity to thank you in person for all of the work you've done over the last uh, couple of years at State, but also the 30 years prior. Uh, I think that many of you probably know that Assistant Secretary Medina is somebody who shows up. She talks the, or I guess walks the talk and talks the walk. Um, for nearly 30 years, the Environmental Change and Security Program has, uh, here at the Wilson Center, has worked to elevate environmental issues in foreign policy, international development, and security. And for every one of those 30 years, Monica Medina has been encouraging, enabling, and inspiring um, policies and actions that better account for the critical importance of environmental, uh, environmental protection and conservation. Uh, she's really dedicated her career to building that connective tissue between um, issues of the environment and conservation to foreign policy and, and U.S. domestic policy as well. So thank you very much for those many years um, and for the work that you've done at the State Department, and, and we look forward to seeing how you take that work forward. Um, I thought, I'm actually going to start with a question that I had thought I would ask it towards the end. <laughs> um, but thinking about the career that you've had, you know, you started at the Army, you were on Capitol Hill, you've been in conservation and philanthropic organizations, um, you've worked on Arctic conservation and restoring the Gulf of Mexico um, after Deepwater Horizon. Um, I, if you could just take a moment to reflect on more than three decades of working in this space uh, and how you've seen the field change in that time and, and how you've seen the advancement of the field reflected in your time at OES. That's such a great question. And I, you know, I look out and I see so many people I've worked with over the decades. I feel so fortunate to have been part of this amazing community. And, um, and then I see some of my young colleagues sitting in the front, and I think, oh, good, we are passing this on to a group of people who are very able to take on these challenges. So what's changed? I think um, a greater recognition of the connectedness of all of the issues that um, really we put under that environment umbrella. I think about when I started, I, I actually started um, in the Army, uh, as you noted, working on the um, Corps of Engineers. Uh, this, the head of the Corps of Engineers sits in the Army. It's um, the Assistant Secretary for Civil Works, and I was his legal advisor, and they were implementing a new law on water resources. And it seemed um, like a new era of possibilities to think about water resources and how we were going to use them in a way that might be more effective, um, more uh, environmentally conscious. And that, that was a wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, it was sort of limited. And I think what, now when I look back at it, having just been at this UN Water Conference, where really what we're trying to advance is the notion that water connects us and that the entire water cycle connects the planet. And so the water that happens to um, fall in our west is intimately connected to the rainforests in the Amazon or the hurricanes that hit our Gulf Coast. Um, you know, and the ocean currents affect, um, that, that affect our, um, our weather patterns, um, you know, traverse the entire Atlantic Ocean, um, and that some of the weather patterns start in the Sahara, you know. Yeah. So the, 
what's really changed is the sense that these problems are interconnected, our health, um, the health of the planet, the health of all the things that live on the planet, and that we have this intergenerational responsibility in addition to this current responsibility. And if I hope that the, the you know, the change that will continue to happen is, is more of the sort of thinking that indigenous communities have long held, which is that these are intergenerational issues. You know, we think about um, in, our, in our pollution permitting world, we think about for, say, extractive activities um, that we, the polluter will, will pay to clean up whatever mess they make in doing that. And obviously, you know, um, that happens. Uh, but it's always a pay me later. And I think what we're realizing is that we have to have that payment now, <laughs> that we can't afford to wait to the later. Um, and so this notion of nature positivity, that for all extraction there needs to be a current um, plussing up of the balance sheet for nature. Um, and the, the idea that uh, we are beginning to account for nature, that the U.S. and other countries are trying to put nature loss on the balance sheet. And, you know, if you think about the environment as sort of the ultimate in um, global commons, uh, and now we think about how everything we do might not only affect us here, but other people in other parts of the world and vice versa, I think that really does make the challenge um, both domestic and international. You know, environmental issues used to be thought of as sort of local. And I think now what's really coming to light is how interconnected they are and how global they are. That's wonderful. I think that that point about moving from reacting to um, sort of accounting for nature in the planning processes, right? And that sort of changes how we do business on a day-to-day -day basis. And I imagine you've seen a lot of that at OES. You alluded to a lot of that in, the, in your opening remarks. Um, I've heard last year referred to as uh, a super year for nature, um, and it sounds like you made the most of it. Your team told me that you t went on 20 different trips around the world. Um, felt like a lot. <laughs> yeah, it felt like a lot. Um, could you share some of the, you, you did this in your opening remarks, but if you could expand on some of the accomplishments that you felt uh, OES sort of um, achieved over the last year, but also where the hurdles were and maybe continue to be in that work? I do think um, finance is a big challenge, uh, and um, that is a focus that was the focus of Earth Day, invest mm -hmm. in our planet uh, this year, but it is something that we need to figure out um, relatively quickly because uh, we need to invest in the planet without conserving nature, without um, putting nature aside to, to, to sustain us. We will... Um, we will suffer the consequences. And I think we're seeing that now as the world becomes more crowded and we need to be even more mindful of the, the finite um, resources we have, you know, the same amount of water on the planet from the time immemorial. And in the last 40 years, twice as many people drawing on it to, for food and for their own, you know, drinking water and for sanitation. So that's a huge, um, I think, uh, you know, realization that that we have to think of these things as um, as really uh, valuable and put a value on them, not so that we can sell them per se, but just so that we can <clears throat> conserve them. Yeah. No, I think uh, I mean that's absolutely right. Is recognizing the value and and thinking about um, how it plays into things like trade and economic development, um, even into our responses to climate change, right? Making sure that we don't have unintended consequences, consequences as yeah. we... Um, um, and you mentioned in your remarks the, the importance of the collaboration with other countries. And I know you've worked to, to strengthen relations with the Pacific Island nations, uh, Central and South, South American governments, and African nations. Can you talk a little bit about those relationships? And, and you, in your remarks, you alluded to how that um, collaboration was from the start of these conversations, right? It wasn't, it was, it was a real partnership in yes. thinking about how we address these issues. It, it was really interesting to me that early on, um, I was sort of welcomed into this group of environmental ministers from around the world who, um, who collaborate, who, who call on each other, who think about these issues. And we really strategized, for example, when it came to 30 by 30, how are we gonna get that done? Um, it, it took an awful lot of work, um, 
you know, the, there was a, a, a plan that was put together by a lot of the countries um, to, on sort of what did 30 by 30 really mean. It was a 10-point plan. That was really um, something that the ministers themselves really thought of in collaboration with one another. So I, that was really um, encouraging to me, that we can create these kinds of uh, networks mm -hmm. within our community of leaders. And, and they all each drew on the NGOs and you know, the, the entrepreneurs and the, um, the uh, innovators in their countries to think about how to solve these challenges. And so th it's, it's been one of the most unexpected and wonderful parts about this job is the, is the collaboration with other governments so closely uh, that I wouldn't have expected. And we, the US, were welcomed into that even as countries wondered, well, will we stay? And I think mm -hmm. the answer is yes, because we're building it into our policies in ways that are um, that are more uh, that are more publicly accepted and and that build bipartisan support behind the work that we're doing. Yeah, a lot of the um, just education is a big piece of this, right? And helping to communicate the importance of these issues more broadly. Can you? Are there examples of how um, sort of those policies have been developed in that way that you could point to? Gosh, um, I do think that uh, the, um, you know, the effort at public-private partnerships with philanthropic organizations, I think one of the other big game changers has been the rise of large philanthropic organizations, mm -hmm. the interest of uh, big donors, the VIS Fund, the Bezos Earth Fund. Um, they help to galvanize support for the work that we're doing and make it... Um, uh, seem more possible than it might have before. Uh, so I do think um, one of the things that sticks out in my mind is the is is the our ocean conference mm -hmm. as a way that Secretary Kerry actually thought of bringing people together to make commitments publicly, not to make declarations. You know, often these international meetings result in a declaration where mm -hmm. countries all agree and they, you know, they have to wordsmith very carefully because words do matter. <gasps> This was more about commitments and what would you do. And it was irrespective of whether you were a government or a philanthropic organization or an NGO or a, um, or a business. He just welcomed everyone to the table to make whatever contributions they could, to have a conversation that was broader, that included actors that weren't necessarily just governments. You know, in the government meetings, it tends to be just governments and all the NGOs and everybody else has to do things as side events. The, our ocean conference, the whole thing is just a giant, you know, um, uh, opportunity for everyone to collaborate, to talk, to have conversations. Similar one is the Stockholm Water Week, which um, is another place where people come together. I do think that's uh, a real innovation and um, something that will uh, that has changed the way we think about how to solve these problems in concert with others. So think about the Pacific Islands. We went to the Our Ocean Conference in Palau. Palau was the host. The U.S. helped as co-host and arrived there. And the 14 nations that make up our, um, our partners in the Pacific Tuna Treaty said the U.S. hasn't upped its um, contribution in 20 years. It's time for you all to bring more, and we mean it this time. And it was just me and the 14 <laughs> nations. And I was really struck by the fact that we had to do something. This was a moment where we had to decide, you know, are we going to step up? And, and I had been talking to our team before that about what if this was not just about tuna, this tuna treaty? We have this unique relationship with the 14 countries in the Pacific Islands. What if we expanded that to talk about the things that we know they care about, climate change, the blue economy. How could we take this unique relationship that we, the U.S. government, had and turn it into something more? And so we started talking to them about that. And lo and behold, I, I did come back and make a pretty strong case that we needed to increase our, our support. And luckily, I wasn't alone. We had a strong Asia Pacific Bureau, um, and we also had a lot of support on Capitol Hill for that. And lo and behold, we were able to secure the additional funding. So now that support is $60 million a year for 10 years, so $600 million that those governments can count on. But we also said to them, let us help you with marine spatial planning so that your blue economies can take off. Because without that kind of planning, it's hard to know how to best use their, your, your ocean space. 
And these are ocean countries, right? Their ocean space far out, out, um, outnumbers their, the size of their land mass. And so for them, learning how to best utilize and to protect parts of the ocean that are critical in their domestic EEZs was really, really important and, and a tremendous opportunity. So that's, that's a, a one pragmatic way that we sort of you know, learned from listening to yeah. people um, in, those region, in that region um, and tried to change our foreign policy uh, to accommodate what we thought they needed and to be better partners. Uh, you, you've talked about sort of the importance of, I mean, you mentioned Biden's uh, approach on day one, right? He really has this whole of government approach to climate, to environmental issues, and you've alluded to the um, sort of whole of society approach, right? And engaging with underrepresented voices and, and marginalized communities and indigenous communities and women and youth and, right, sort of um, thinking about civil society's roles, uh, philanthropic organizations. In that context, what is OES's role? Like, where do you think OES can sit most um, effectively? I think OES can be a great uh, convener. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely have uh, um, the ability to bring people together. I think that's what the the plastic uh, um, public-private partnership is, what we call it now, P3. But um, EPIC is what we hope it will be called, um, and plastic pollution uh, I forget what the INC are standing for, but I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> anyway, it's, um, oh gosh, I'll think of it. That's okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, the idea that we can bring some small amount of government resources, create something that will live on its own, bring in partners from the private sector, from philanthropic organizations, uh, and help to create that platform like the Our Ocean Conference yeah. was, that platform where people just come and try and find solutions. Not where we negotiate a document with a bunch of text, but where we actually look for solutions that we can then inject into an agreement that hopefully will make it even more robust and more um, ambitious than it would have been if, if we as governments had just sort of gotten together and, and tried to come up with some very prescriptive formula. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Um, I'm watching the clock. I want to make sure we have some time for questions from the audience. Um, and I see some hands going up. So I think I'll, I have another question, but I'll wait till the end. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll share the time here. Um, so uh, it was Andrea, right? Can the woman right there, please. And I'm going to ask you to, to share your name and affiliation if you have one before uh, getting to your question. If you could keep your question fairly tight so that we can get to as many in the room, that would be great. Thank you. And I'm sorry to interrupt again. We're going to take, uh, uh, two, uh, we'll take two questions at a time. Thank you. Go ahead. I can repeat the question too. Yeah, there there uh, what policies or laws are needed in the U.S. or other countries to combat um, plastic pollution that should include single use of plastic? What is your idea? Great. Thank you. Oh, we'll take one more question okay. before. Um, just the woman there in the green jacket. So first, thanks for all the work that you're doing. And secondly, yes, the private sector has many solutions, but we're still five trillion short of the investment levels we need to get to net zero. And as a former climate negotiator at the State Department and someone who's worked on hybrid business models, I wonder if you could tell us what your thoughts are on what the obstacles are, both in terms of risks and asymmetric information, um, what's holding back these investments, given that there are solutions, and is part of that the global recession threat that we all think we're facing? Uh, excellent question. So um, on plastic pollution, I do believe we need um, national plans. I don't know that there's a one-size-fits-all approach to this. Uh, for some, it may be very prescriptive, and it may start with... Um, banning single-use plastic or certain types of it. You know, other countries have done that, and, and, and we in the U.S. think that's fine. Um, we don't have a domestic plastic pollution law. We don't have an easy way to do that. Um, our plastic pollution regulations um, really are more at the state and local level. And so I think 
just harmonizing um, standards as best we can, creating some prohibitions where we know things are very, very toxic and maybe that's um, not a, a good thing to have in material that carries our food or, um, or uh, you know, that we, that we um, want to be able to recycle so we can use it again. Uh, so I think there, there are things that, um, you know, that national governments can do. We in the U.S. have, have less of those great big national law um, opportunities. So we'll have to be more creative. Um, I think, you know, for us, um, and one thing that I know uh, we'll be looking into more and more is how to use government um, purchasing to impact, uh, you know, how much um, plastic we in the government or single-use plastic, say, we in the government use. And I know some agencies have already d started that, down that path, like the Interior Department. So I hope to see more of that. Uh, and I'm, I'm convinced that if we bring private ingenuity and, um, and public funding and, and private funding and, um, and all the countries of the world together, we'll, we'll come up with the answers that we need on plastic pollution. On climate funding, I think the U.S. government um, just uh, announced a billion dollars to the global uh, to the Green Climate Fund. Um, that was uh, another huge um, foot forward for the U.S. And we are um, working very hard. Secretary Kerry travels the world, looking um, to galvanize uh, private investment in climate. And the energy sector provides a tremendous opportunity, uh, not only for um, changing our climate trajectory, but also for investment and for helping countries develop in ways that are sustainable, actually developing, um, you know, their own small-scale solar and wind projects that will help communities all over the world be able to both grow um, their economies and do it sustainably. So I'm optimistic about that. I think water is another place where if we begin to have um, more uh, rational government policies on water um, globally around the world um, that will help build uh, an investment pipe pipeline for water and water uh, security around the world that will help solve um, a lot of the big challenges that we see given climate change so I think we have to be creative we have to think about valuing nature we have to think about how to make all development projects nature positive as opposed to pay me later kind of projects and, um, and, and uh, you know, the private sector uh, is going to be a huge part of this. It's just they haven't had to account for nature in the past, but I, I'm confident that they will um, increasingly have to do that in the future. And, uh, and there won't be sort of these stranded costs that we see out there everywhere um, because we've taken advantage of the environment. We haven't really taken care of it. Thank you. Take a couple of questions. I think there were some in the back. Um, gentleman on the, um, Angus, if you could go to the gentleman in the back there. Just a reminder to share your name and affiliation. Uh, good morning, Francisco Alvarez. I'm a climate researcher, and I am also from Mexico, and I've been focused a lot on water access challenges in northern Mexico. Um, I know that environmental protection often really falls that, well, the enforcement environmental protection falls on local authorities. Mm -hmm. um, but as someone who also comes from civil society, who has been a climate and environmental advocate, um, you know, I wonder if within the framework of environmental uh, diplomacy, are there mechanisms for civil society actors to bring forth concerns when, let's say, uh, they feel their local state authorities are not acting in the interest of environmental protection, um, or even if they are concerned that U.S. corporations or U.S. programs may be creating additional pressures on existing environmental challenges. What can you do within the framework of environmental diplomacy? Can you leverage that convening power? Is there kind of a name and shame that you can uh, utilize? Or can you also maybe cite specific examples um, where you know, you're bringing to bear these concerns at the local or civil society level? Uh, thank you. Great question. I can take one more. Max? I'm gonna take the the space to thank you. I think I think it's um, you know it's a big Max, challenge. I'm sorry, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, Max Bello from Mission Blue and also fellow of the Wilson Center. Um, I wanna um, you know the challenge of being someone from the um, NGO sector 
um, all the expectations um, and to have that work. I have to say you're very humble on saying, you know, all the work that you've done on the BB&J, one of the most important treaties for the ocean um, and, and the 30 by 30, which will change the face of uh, conservation, marine conservation. The, <laughs> the fact that you were um, very critical on, on all the process to get all the countries, countries to agree on a new way to protect the ocean as the Eastern Tropical Pacific have done, it is incredible bringing the US into that. And, and also being at the Kamlar for uh, Antarctica, which not have been mentioned, I know we still have a long way, but you did it, you went, you put the uh, you know, high sort of uh, bar on that. I think you have done so much more than we even um, uh, thought you could. I think it, you really have done an incredible job, left a huge har, a high bar, and we really appreciate that. And having a team that has been open um, constantly to everyone with all the requests, the requests that you know, NGOs, private sector, and many others have, I think it's really, I've never had the opportunity before uh, to yes. actually um, be in so much in contact with all of you and, and do the work, feeling part of it uh, with the USA. I really appreciate it. And I really want to thank you. And I want to ask for a big applause for all of <laughs> you. No, Max, that was really well stated. And it's absolutely true, I think. Um, you've set the tone at OES, and I, working with your colleagues Justin and Kate and others, um, it's, it's an extraordinary group of people that you're working with and, and helping to shape the future. So thank you very much. Um, Let me go back yeah, to the yes, first question, the question. Yep. because it really does, I think, hit on something else yeah. that's completely different than when I started, which is the ability to use public accountability mm -hmm. as a mechanism for enforcement. When I think about these big environmental agreements of the future, I think they'll be more effective if they look more like the Paris Agreement um, because we can hold each other accountable in ways that is actually, I think, puts more pressure on governments uh, than, say, some um, dispute mechanism under a treaty that takes years and years and sort of happens in some court somewhere that you know you wouldn't necessarily see reported in your local newspaper. But the way that we can hold ourselves accountable, all of us accountable, are much greater. You can hold corporations accountable because they can have to report on their plastic load. Or you can hold uh, countries accountable because they have to assess their greenhouse gas emissions and how they're reducing them towards a nationally determined contribution that everyone can see. So to me, that's the breakthrough here, and we should be embracing this notion of using public accountability and these uh, mechanisms that, um, I don't like to think of name and shame because that's so negative, but just that show people progress. Um, to me, that's such a huge breakthrough, the fact that we have data that we can use to actually try to measure 30 by 30 and our ability to actually achieve it in ways that are measured and meaningful. To me, that's the, that is the promise of the future, and we shouldn't necessarily um, just uh, sort of think about, you know, the old ways we used to achieve environmental conservation gains. CMAR, another perfect example, countries deciding to work together because they've decided it's in their own interest to be expansive in their in their cooperation on um, on conservation, to me that's brilliant. And you know, if if we can help um, lift that up, uh, that's what we all should be trying to do. I, I um, you're too kind, Max. You're you're you know. There are times where I did say we need to change the way the U.S. government thinks about this or that problem. And I sat down and talked to the people inside OES. And um, you know, yes, did we did did I. I think help to maybe you know steer the ship slightly in a different direction. Yes, but I think it is in the direction of progress. And it wasn't hard when you know we sat down and we thought about where do we want to be as as a society, as a planet. How do we get there? It wasn't hard to see that um, we needed to to change our thinking around some of these big big challenges. Um, so 
t to me, this was um, an opportunity to work with the best people, with a president who cared about these issues. And I was fortunate enough to work on, on them even as a volunteer in the campaign setting. Um, so to sort of see the shape of the policies from the very beginning. And I just, I, I have to pinch myself every day that I'm actually sitting here because, you know, President Biden wasn't always seen as the front runner <laughs> in the race. And, you know, he's, he was always such an environmental champion from the beginning of the campaign. And so uh, it's been such a, an unbelievable honor to be part of that. And, and I think the government and even, you know, the, all the people who work in governance, whether it's from the industry side or the NGO side, um, you know, can, can take energy from the top. And for me, this president really will, I think, go down in history as one of the most conservation-oriented presidents, whether it's the infrastructure bill that's going to change the way we think about infrastructure, natural infrastructure being much more part of the way we build out our future, um, to the Inflation Reduction Act and all the things that we're going to do to make the energy transition, to help water security, all, uh, you know, eliminate lead pipes in this country as a way to make everyone healthier. Gosh, what a legacy that will be. I think, you know, decades from now, people will, will think of this time as another golden time for conservation and the environment. And for me, it was just wonderful to get to be in this job at this moment, working with all of you, working with the team of really talented people in the State Department all around the world. Um, you know, when I was before this, I taught at Georgetown uh, as an adjunct professor, and the energy that the students had, the interest they had in these issues is tremendous. And um, I was just in an alumni event over the weekend, and um, the head of their new school on sustainability was talking about how they're trying to build an entire curriculum around this kind of work, because that's where young people want to be. It's not that they want to be marching in the streets only. They want to be a part of the solution, and we have to build that for them and, and integrate it into the way we think about our economy going forward, our health going forward, our um, and our well-being going forward. I think that's probably the best note to end on. I, I want to thank you so much, Assistant Secretary, for all you. of your years of work and especially for the role that you played at State. Um, it's going to be very exciting to see where you take uh, forward your work at the Wildlife Conservation Society. I know we hosted you here when you were at National Geographic Society. Yes. And then we have today. And so I look forward to welcome you back um, in your role at, at WCS. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, colleagues in the Latin American program, Benjamin and your team, for really holding the reins on today's event and the Brazil Institute and Polar Institute for their co-sponsorship and our AV team, which without, without whom nothing is, is possible. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to all who are listening online. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to the Wilson Center for hosting me for this. It means the world. No, it's our it's pleasure. The world to me. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for coming today.